Okay. Good morning and welcome to the 28th meeting of the committee in 2014. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Some committee members may consult tablets during the meeting. Uh, this is because we provide meeting papers in a digital format. Agenda item one today is an oral evidence session on the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. We have one panel of witnesses uh, giving evidence this morning. I'd like to welcome the panel, Derek Mackay, MSP, Minister for Local Government and Planning, Alistair McKinley, Head of Community Planning and Community Empowerment, Jean Waddy, Bill Manager, and Dr Amanda Fox, Food and Drink Policy Leader from the Scottish Government. Welcome uh, and good morning. Would you like to make any opening remarks, Minister? Thank you very much, Convener. And can I say at the outset, I think it's a very helpful way that the committee has endeavoured to be proactive in your um, research and, and studying of the bill. And I know that people appreciate it. Just this week I was in Dumfries and they were telling me about the committee's uh, visit there and using new ways of working is also helpful in exploring the potential of the bill. The bill essentially creates new rights for community bodies and new duties on public authorities, providing a legal framework that will promote and encourage community empowerment and participation. Of course, there is a difference between engagement and consultation, participation and community ownership and leadership itself. The, the new rights will empower communities through the use and ownership of land and buildings and strength and involvement around participation, I think, will be very healthy for democracy uh, too. Of course, the bill can't come a moment too soon. I think people have got an appetite uh, to take this forward, and it's very timely, clearly, the referendum. We may disagree on uh, the uh, you know, what decision we sought through the referendum, but surely it is a further clarion call for action for people to be empowered and engaged and public services in their communities and hopefully the bill will help create the conditions in which that sense of enthusiasm and en engagement can prosper. Thank you, uh, Minister. Um, if I could turn uh, first of all to uh, the Finance Committee's comments uh, about the financial memorandum uh, in which the Finance Committee are somewhat critical. Uh, would you like to, to comment on that please, Minister? Of course, Convener, I understand and we take very seriously the work of uh, the Finance Committee and this committee to look at the financial assumptions and the ability to provide uh, best estimates for any piece of legislation. But I'm sure this committee will be well aware that it's very difficult to put a cash figure to essentially quantify the cost of an empowering piece of legislation because there are so many variables who may come forward, for example, in an asset transfer request, what the value of that property may be, what the value will be transferred at, how many, where, how it happens, the costs involved from each local authority. And it's just an example of how the variability is such that I would not want to offer this committee a flawed figure. I would rather not do that. But what we have been able to do is showcase in evidence the nature of costs across the country on examples of, for example, asset, asset transfers or other matters to show how there is a wide range. Essentially, what Parliament's expected to understand is the, the potential cost of a bill and there's um, checks and balances within that. And Of course, any public authority in considering the transfer of an asset would have to consider um, economic impact and wider benefits. Um, but again, I say that we've endeavoured to give the best possible information we can, and I can simply agree with COSLA on this occasion that the bill's not overly onerous in terms of its finances on the public sector. So if you take another example on participation requests or indeed how local authorities engage with their communities, they should already be doing it now in terms of engagement anyway, so it's not adding a particularly cumbersome new burden upon those local authorities is creating consistency, removing barriers and strengthening people's rights. But the infrastructure to engage is already there. So that which we can't quantify, we're not going to make up a figure for a nicety, uh, but we have absolutely set out the kind and nature of costs that would be involved in an asset transfer. I'm happy to go on further uh, if, if the committee requires me to do so, but it's not through lack of effort 
or any difficulty with local authorities. I spoke to the relevant spokesperson just yesterday on the Community Empowerment Bill. So it's not a matter of conflict. It's simply a matter where we've put the evidence on the table as to what the costs may look like, but we feel it's not appropriate to come up with a false figure. That would be both misleading and it would give the false impression to communities that will set either a floor or a ceiling or an arbitrary target, which we're not doing. This is about empowerment, not an accountancy exercise, but we do believe we've fulfilled the requirements upon us by the uh, Finance Committee. But it's quite right that you probe me further on what costs may be involved and what ramifications the Bill may have, of course. If I could hearken back um, to uh, a few years back when uh, there was great concern about uh, the implementation of freedom of information uh, legislation uh, and how that would uh, affect uh, local authorities financially. Um, and it transpired that uh, it was not as onerous as, as was originally thought. Do you think that something similar is likely to happen with participation requests? And was there any analysis done at the time of FOI um, to, to look at the actual differences that there were at that point? Well, I think it's very fair to say, Convener, that some of the pressures that Freedom of Information brought about, um, it, it was able to be proportionate, and public authorities, of course, were able to, to deny those requests that were, were too costly, and it has generated extra costs to the public sector. But this legislation is encouraging a best practice and I think it would be worth it and I think it will focus the mind of public servants in considering how they engage with communities in the decisions that they make and then when requests are made to be involved that that will also be proportionate and some may argue it's too costly and just let the decision makers get on with it and don't engage but that's entirely not in the spirit of this legislation or indeed the current guidance around good consultation and the uh, uh, the spirit of community plan partnerships and what should be done already. Indeed, the Accounts Commission have said that there should be greater involvement with communities. So put into context, I think cost <clears throat> would be both reasonable and proportionate, but there would be that ongoing monitoring to all parts of the public sector and to local authorities and in their engagement with Scottish Government that if this bill did have the kind of financial impact that raised concerns, then I'm sure we would monitor that. Um, local authorities have a duty around uh, uh, balancing their books and understanding the strength of their assets as well. So let's say this bill is so successful and so empowering that there are many groups across the country that come forward to acquire assets, to take on new land, so on and so forth, and then local authorities and other parts of the Scottish Government would have to consider that and, and look at the financial consequences. But I think that it will be reasonable and proportionate. It will remain under review. And essentially, um, I don't think there will be a rush to purchase assets and therefore values will be wiped off public sectors, um, asset register and their books and so on. But I think there will be far better engagement and I think there will be more asset transfers because if you asked us what success looks like, it's more community ownership more transfers. The bill should encourage that to happen, but in a way uh, that's very mindful of our wider financial responsibilities. Bearing in mind, of course, that some transfers, better involvement, better prevention, will also make financial savings as well. Equally difficult to quantify, but if we're serious about the preventative approach, then we recognise that there's financial gains to this, um, as well as some potential uh, loss to the public sector in terms of the value of assets. But I think the bureaucracy, the cost of servicing this, could easily be subsumed. If you take, example, the common good requirements, it's already the case, SIPFA request that the register, the understanding of assets as they relate to common goods, is already separate from mainstream council funding. So it shouldn't be too onerous to be able to produce a register of what's in the common good fund and what these assets uh, are how you then engage with communities. And if public sector does it more collaboratively through community plan partnerships, for example, then it could replace some of the duplication costs of various consultation exercises rather than doing it once properly and, and I think, more effectively. OK, um, I think that's very useful and we have your assurance that there will be that ongoing monitoring of the situation. Um, and uh, I, I think, you know, seeing a, a list of some of the 
uh, assets that have been transferred in Dumfries and Galloway, for example, which is quite extensive thus far. It would be interesting to hear from some of the authorities whether some of these assets were actually assets or, or were actually liabilities in their books. But uh, I'm glad to hear that, we'll, that you will be continuing to, to monitor, as will we. Cameron Buchanan, please. Sorry. Uh, good morning, Minister. Just to say, I think it's in the Finance Committee report it said that best estimates have not been provided. Can, is it, should there not be some sort of estimate? Should we not have some sort of costing? I, real, I, real, I heard what you were saying earlier, but there should be something there because the Finance Committee was pretty critical of that in both sections of it. I understand the rules of the Parliament. I understand the wish and the desire of the Finance Committee to have a full understanding of cost. If Mr Buchanan and this committee want me to fabricate and make up a figure, I will do that but I think that would be utterly flawed. I think it would send the wrong message in terms of a floor, of a ceiling, of what this legislation is about. You see, it's fairly easy for local authorities to produce a cost of how much it costs an official to do something. That's quantifiable. What's not quantifiable is what does this legislation release in terms of community engagement and empowerment, which groups will come forward to acquire public sector assets from where and at what value is impossible to predict. So if we make up a figure as an accountancy nicety, it can be done, but it's utterly misleading because it's a figure for the sake of a figure, whereas we believe we've provided the best estimates in that we can show the bureaucracy of the bill can be absorbed. It's not, in Cosler's words, overly onerous. And I tell you, in negotiating with COSLA, if they thought it was overly onerous, they would be saying so. And if they thought there were substantial new costs, then they would be um, uh, stating that. We'll continue with negotiations with, with COSLA, of course. But we believe by setting out what we have done through current practice, through current asset transfers, through the kind of burdens that would be added upon public authorities, then we've provided as reasonable a, an estimate and a uh, as figures as we can. But to be able to say this bill will cost in a range of A to B is not possible because you can't predict what the demand will be from the community. But of course it's something that we'll continue to monitor. So it's not a lack of effort. It's the falseness of providing an arbitrary figure. And I would rather not mislead Parliament or the committee by fabricating a figure. I don't think you were being accused of lack of effort. It was just that the Finance Committee needed some sort of estimate and some sort of cost, some sort of basis, if you like, a, a before and after, top and bottom costs. So if I, I mean, I understand the reason you may wish to do this. And if I said it's our prediction then that so many groups will come forward at a certain mm -hmm. level to a value of, um, you know, £10 million, that's the value of which communities may want to transfer. That would be a completely false figure because no one will know. This bill unlocks the potential locally to have asset transfers, greater participation requests, greater understanding of common good. It's easier to quantify the bureaucracy of servicing the machine, i.e. the state and understanding asset registers and so on, but what we can't predict in all reasonableness is what communities will come forward to acquire what at what value. And what the committee, of course, will want to be reassured of, that this won't wipe off the mm. capital assets of the public sector in one fell swoop. <laughs> it, that would be incredibly empowering, but not particularly affordable. So that affordability, that, that public benefit test, those checks and balances are all <coughs> built in to every single asset transfer decision that would be made, for example, and the wider considerations of how a local authority or public authority, because we're very mindful this goes beyond local councils, it's into all parts of public sector, would be very mindful of the requests and the decisions they are making in view of their financial outlook and the assets that they hold. But I say again, if it's a recommendation of this committee to produce a figure for a figure's sake, I can do it, but it would be utterly false, and therefore I would encourage the committee not to make such a recommendation, rather than to, it's not for me to advise, to, to, to ask you what to do, but I think it would be more credible if I was to provide an analysis of what asset transfers are happening across the country as a consequence of the legislation and, and how do public finances look as a, as, a, as a result and take any necessary action. That's something we would do anyway. That's something that the public authorities would do anyway. But to set a figure would have too many variables within it for that figure to be credible. 
Thank you, Minister. Okay. As you well know, this committee continues uh, to, to look at things after the event, and uh, I think we would be monitoring that. Cameron? That's okay, thank you. I want to stick to the financial uh, situation at this moment. I've got three names. Oh, Anne, was your, yours on finance? It's just yeah, on you go, Anne, please. Good morning, panel, and good morning, Minister. Um, just to, still to stick on this, I, I've got loads more other questions, but I'll ask them later. I've heard your every word um, this morning so far, but can I ask for some reassurances within around the area of allotments? Councils are worried about the financial memorandum. They are worried about having to provide um, the duty for the additional allotments. What, what words of wisdom and advice and reassurances can you give them? I'm not sure about words of wisdom, but maybe words of reassurance I can offer to local authorities, which is really that the legislation updates and simplifies that which was there before. Uh, and the new trigger point uh, in terms of demand for allotments and then providing them has that reasonableness test. The councils must take all reasonable steps to satisfy demand. So it's not an absolute trigger point that when you reach a certain level, you must produce allotments in said time, in said place for said people, because that leaves the flexibility of local authorities to adapt to circumstances. So it's about taking all reasonable steps to be able to meet that uh, provision. We're also quite flexible and leave it to local authorities around the um, size and the nature of the allotments as well. So we're not being too uh, prescriptive and... I think much of the, the legislation simply um, simplifying what was there before. So hopefully that reassures um, local authorities that this is not a, a huge new burden placed upon them. But certainly is moving along the lines of being more proactive. Anne? And I welcome that, Minister. Thank you. But um, now for to try and reassure the allotmenteers. Um, their concern is that to for their local governments um, to meet those duty requirements, whatever, that allotment sizes may well be reduced or halved, quartered. And for some people, that, that's fine and fair dues. They, they, they wish for that to happen. You know, they want a smaller allotment size. However, it would be easy or it could be easy for to enable you to get your figures as a local authority for to half or quarter the size of the allotment to fulfil your duties? I think it's a fair point. I, I think uh, it's very skillful the way Anne McTaggart's playing both sides of the same argument to make sure that I'm completely thrilled. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I, I like the word allotmenteers as well. We uh, might use uh, that. Indeed, in uh, not to be f confused with the growing lobby, incidentally. Allotments and the, the growing uh, lobby are two um, different enthusiasts, as my officials advise me to protect yes. me. <laughs> um, I think it's a fair point, but you know, to meet the spirit of the uh, legislation, um, the trigger point would encourage a local authority to meet the demand. But the demand might be a space to grow, and it doesn't have to be a set space for the size of the allotment. We do want to leave that um, to local authorities to be able to define I think, again, it would send the wrong message about empowerment and localism if I determined everything centrally in Edinburgh, including the size of an allotment, when there may be local variations required for good reason. For example, the size and nature of a site or the size of an allotment that local people may want to have. People who have different needs and demands. Not everyone might want the full-scale allotment with all the work that goes along with it. So, in essence, I'd like to put a bit of faith in local authorities that would generally try to meet demand and get the right size of allotments and spaces that would be required for local communities in view of circumstances. Uh, and I don't think, let's say if we have established allotments already in place, that the council would then just try to reduce the size of those to, to meet needs, because that would be changing what people have already. I think this will be about new sites. But my experience over the last few years, um, not just as a minister, but as a constituency member, indeed before that as a ward councillor, is that some people will want a full-scale allotment to do the variety of things, and other people will just want some space to grow some basic vegetables. So people's needs are different. Um, now, we, do have, we will have powers if required. If councils did go down that road of being so minimalist 
and meagre mm-hmm. in their approach, which I don't think they would. But if they did, then we would have, through the legislation, the ability to prescribe the size of allotment if we felt <coughs> that was necessary. So we do have that power. Thank you, Minister. OK. Thank you. Uh, Alec Crowley, please. As a keen allotment grower, I wouldn't disagree with, with what the Minister has to say, although I would say that if we were serious about actually looking at um, people growing food and, and actually driving that agenda for, for health and wellbeing reasons and fitness reasons, then it will have a resource implication. And it's the resources, I suppose, that, that, that this part of the question is on. I mean, I look at COSLA, and COSLA actually state, Minister, that local government will incur extra costs as a result of these provisions um, and it is not possible to allocate money to these costs from our budgets without taking it from other activities. We would expect central government to add to our settlement any money necessary to fulfil the provision of the bill. And that, I suppose, is the Finance Committee's concerns. The Glasgow City Council raise it and basically say it will be challenging to meet these costs from existing resources and Clyde Council, North, North Ayrshire, North Lanarkshire. All these councils are raising that they believe there will be significant financial implications um, from this bill. I get what you say about not being able to quantify it, but do you intend to, to, to ensure that any costs that are coming through as a result of this bill will be in the settlement? Minister? Yes, it's been a custom and practice with this Scottish Government that if the Government produces a new burden upon local authorities that we fund that burden. Of course, that's, as Mr Rowley well knows, a matter of negotiation with COSLA and local government. At what fig- figure that we a- arrive at, so that ongoing monitoring uh, will assist us. But it has been the case if we have, as a consequence of the uh, government's work, imposed a burden on local authorities that we fund that. So yes, in essence, it is the commitment. Of course, bearing in mind that the provisions of this bill extend beyond um, well, local authorities in terms of allotments is specific to them, but if you take participation requests or asset transfers or the wider duties in community planning, extend beyond local authorities. So there will be costs to government and government agencies too, health and police and justice and other departments that have not necessarily had the same exposure to that level of community engagement or participation or asset transfer requests, there will be costs there as well. But remember what we're trying to achieve is empowering local communities through uh, participation and public ownership and community-led regeneration and so on. Uh, there will be a cost to, to various parts of the public sector. But yes, we would continue to discuss it with, with local authorities. And it would be remiss of me if I didn't make the main point or the general point around finance in Scotland, which is in terms of the Scottish Government's block, uh, roughly two-thirds goes to health and local government and one-third to everything else. And within that, of course, the budget will increase in terms of grant support to local authorities from $10.6 billion to $10.8 billion, which is a cash increase with new responsibilities, of course. Um, but I think the budget protection proportionate as it is that we've been able to provide to local authorities um, compares I think very well with what's happened south of the border because we don't see the transfer of assets as the disposing of liabilities to communities but very empowering legislation so yes it will come at a price and we'll continue to discuss that with local authorities in all parts of the public sector as to how it may affect them. Mr. Rowley. I think in terms of the evidence that, that we've been taking here, and certainly the evidence I know for the for my own area, uh, it's not so much in terms of um, losing a capital asset. If you take Fife's case, where they've been doing a major review over the last two and a half years for the new administration, went and they've been I'm quite quite happy for for community organisations to take over buildings. They're actually trying to get rid of a load of buildings and they're trying to pool services together into, into one building. Um, so, so if you take, for example, um, in my, my, own, my own 
constituency, there's, there's three or four council buildings being pulled into one and a new community centre being built as a result of that. Um, there's a lot of that being happening and there's successes in Wellwood, for example, where the, the local churches have taken over a building and running it as a community facility. So that's been encouraged. But what's come up through this bill is things like the allotments, where if you were seriously going to roll out a strategy, then it needs resourced. Um, another issue that continually comes up in terms of the evidence we've been taking is the capacity within communities. If we're saying that this bill is to empower communities and we're actually trying to look at um, areas of high social deprivation, then often the capacity, an exception, uh, would certainly be one area would be Dundee, where we heard some excellent work that's actually going on there in terms of community capacity building and community organisation. But for a lot of these communities, the concern that was being expressed is, does the, does the capacity exist within those communities? Where will the support come to build that capacity and how will it be resourced? Minister? I think they're all fair points and fair questions. And actually, one of the motivating factors of this bill is somewhat revealed by what uh, Mr Rowley said. In terms of, and you quote, in terms of a, a, an asset transfer approach that many local authorities are currently undertaking, some quite successfully, which just goes to show that there isn't a huge financial burden in allowing the community access to, let's face it, sometimes underused and unused buildings. You see, if a building's sitting empty at the moment, it's probably paying non domestic rates, 90% of probably thanks to my legislation on unoccupied properties uh, changes. But if a community group was to go in and had charitable relief, they're probably paying nothing. So you see how better use of buildings can sometimes save money. That's just an example. Mr Rowley said you know, some local authorities are getting ro rid of a load of buildings. Now, I know what is meant, but that's actually part of the problem. The local authorities choose what they want to dispose of rather than sometimes the community being able to say, we could do better with that. I'm sure I think in evidence I've given before when I was a council leader, I took the approach that me and the councillors and the council would decide what was being transferred and uh, the nature of it, rather than the community necessarily be able to request the transfer in a way that was proportionate and fair and reasonable. So I think that's where the bill can make a big difference. But Mr Rowley is right. Co-location is absolutely the way forward in our public service reform uh, uh, agenda. But in terms of capacity and support, the billions of pounds that are already in the system should be aligned to support this agenda. Community plan partnerships should be made to work to have a full plan for place. That's a requirement uh, at the moment. Genuinely share out the planning of resources and assets. And to do that, I think, just requires a recalibration of some of the bureaucratic that support that's there uh, at the moment. In terms of government funding. Even in these times of austerity and financial reduction, we propose an increase in the relevant budgets. Now, give some examples. So, in the People and Communities Fund that would support these kind of projects, we are recommending an increase from £7.9 million this year to £9.4 million in 2015-16. That is the community-led regeneration work, of course, through the People and Communities Fund. We have uh, allocated an additional £900,000 over three years to the Community Ownership Support Service that will support people on the ground that are taking on land and buildings and helping to develop their communities. And, and specifically on that capacity question, through a £3 million Strengthening Communities programme, will support 150 community-led organisations to build their capacity. And that will have a great multiplier effect at the local uh, level as well. And in terms of right to buy and community land ownership, we're also increasing the budget in the Scottish Land Fund as well. So that's another £3 million on top of the £6 million for 15 16 to show that there will be more uh, financial support for community ownership of land as well. So that's just what the Scottish Government's providing as well as that budget increase, in, admittedly in cash terms, to local authorities and making other public authorities aware of their duties in relation to this. And that's why we've rewritten the much-read Scottish Public Finance Manual to reflect the nature of, of, of community transfers and, and asset uh, disposal and other um, priorities. So that's a very fair point uh, to say that we need to expand the capacity of our community. But if we make it more consistent 
I think if we build in legislative provision to tackle inequality, I think if in the guidance we're very mindful in inequalities and there's not a level playing field out there, you know, if you just create this legislation without that added support, then the better off communities will acquire the better at, uh, facilities and the less well off communities won't have the skills and the support and, and necessarily the professionals to make best use of this legislation. And that's why we're tooling up the kind of groups that will support this agenda at a national and a local level. But I would agree we have to ensure that all parts of the public sector are considering this and the support that they provide to communities to make the legislation even more powerful. Alec? Okay. Finally, on, in this area, I, I noticed that, that Leslie Ruddock um, described this bill as toothless um, and has said that there's a missed opportunity here. And I do wonder, when we talk about communities, we could be talking about villages, towns, we could be talking about neighbourhoods. Indeed, it's been pointed out in the evidence that we could be talking about communities of people. But I do wonder, how far do you actually think this bill goes to empower communities? I've raised the question, for example, that, that I think there's a mention in here of community councils, but no more than that. And one of the, one of the, in my own constituency right now, there's three or four community councils that are having elections for the first time in, in some 20 years. And part of the argument is that why would people stand for an election to a body that does not have any powers? Are we satisfied that 32 local authorities as they stand now um, is, is important for communities, or should we not be more, much more bolder than this bill actually goes and look at those community councils or something similar and look at putting real resources down there and, 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 and something about community plans that communities do draw up for the types of services and statute that they can expect? Um, is this bold enough, I suppose, is, is the question. Um, should we not be going much further if we're serious about empowering communities to be able to be in charge of the services and, indeed, the environment in which those communities operate? Minister? Um, I would disagree, absolutely, that the bill is toothless. And I would reflect on the evidence that you've received and I've received through the reference group and elsewhere that actually the bill is broadly welcomed. And when people are specifically asked, will the bill make a difference? The answer is almost universally, yes, it will. And I think it will make a difference. But what I'm not doing is removing the democratic authority of locally elected members who also have a mandate as well as this government and this parliament. So we could go further in disempowering local authorities, transferring more to communities, and we'll see if such amendments uh, come forward. But this was about swinging the, the balance of power towards communities, and I think it does that in participation requests, which will empower <clears throat> groups and communities to be able to initiate uh, you know, decisions and consultations that affect them on their terms. I think that's very empowering. Asset transfers, extending uh, community ownership to, to urban Scotland and making it more flexible as well, bringing in compulsion where there's not a willing uh, seller in terms of the, the land being abandoned uh, and neglected. So I think, there's, I think there's a range of provisions that will be very empowering for local communities, especially as to how we have um, uh, reflected communities and definition of communities uh, in the Bill. And again, I take heart from the evidence and the consultations uh, that you've received that the, the bill will make a difference to people's lives. In terms of um, further amendments, I, I've said to opposition spokespeople and others and the groups that I've been engaging with, if you want to toughen up this bill and do things differently, I'm all ears. And that's why, as the legislation has gone on, we've built in a presumption in favour of transfer to the community. That wasn't there at the start. And that presumption is very important because we're not changing who gets to make the decision, for example, about asset transfers, but we're absolutely changing how the decisions are made and where the balance of power lies with, with that presumption. And that will put, I think, that very strengthening the, the hand of, of, of communities in, in doing that um, in terms of participation requests new rights to be able to initiate um, that dialogue. But Mr Rowley's right. If you were to design local authorities, 
you wouldn't design them the way they are right now. And 32 councils are a consequence of the Tory gener ger sorry, Mr. Buchanan, but the Tory gerrymandering uh, from before. But I'd be concerned that if we tried to reorder the structures of local authorities at this point, it would consume our energy mm -hmm. and end up in boundary disputes and court battles, a bit of a power struggle and people vying for senior jobs in those new organisations rather than focusing on outcomes, which is in essence what this bill and the wider work of government is trying to do. So we're encouraging people to work across boundaries, geographic and institutional and organisational, to focus on those outcomes. And that's why we don't propose any change to the number of local authorities or indeed their boundaries, but we do expect new ways of working. Which takes me to your final point around accountability, and I particularly agree with you on that. In terms of the accountability of community plan partnerships and, and all parts of the public sector through community planning, you've heard evidence, I've heard evidence, Audit Scotland has given statements around the accountability of community plan partnerships. met with them very recently on this as well. That even if we embed, even if we give a, a kind of equal duty to contribute to community plan partnerships, I do think we still have to do more around the accountability of community planning, community plan partnerships. And there is something in that about who holds them to account. If it's not just the audit agencies, how do communities hold uh, community plan partnerships to account? And how do they access that? And I think. If you want to pursue this, I'm happy to give further consideration as to how we maybe produce a stage two amendment to strengthen the accountability of community plan partnerships to their community. I think that's a very fair point. Um, but I would disagree utterly that the bill is not uh, empowering. It is. But you see, we're not trying to empower people in a patronising way of suggesting they're not living their lives properly. It's by removing barriers, creating consistency, giving people access to resources and that which is already there through you know, public ownership, essentially, that's empowering. And I think that builds on the momentum that we've experienced this year. But um, if Mr Rowley or any other person wants to bring forward amendments for me to consider that make it stronger or radical, then I'd happily uh, consider that. And that's the challenge I've put to other commentators who may have views around what we should do. And finally, on, say, land reform, Mr Wheelhouse has made it clear that in response to the land reform review group, the government will set out a timetable, including a land reform bill, that will capture some of the other elements of land reform and other areas uh, that would be relevant in a future bill. But I don't want this bill to be impeded to get on with what we've committed to do. Thank you. Stuart, was your question on finance? Uh, no, it was In which case, I'll take John Wilson first, please. Then. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Minister. Uh, it's really to go back to the financial memorandum and the fears that COSLA have expressed in terms of additional costs that may be incurred by local authorities. Has the Minister considered uh, discussing with his ministerial colleagues some of the benefits that may, financial benefits that may be accrued? in terms of the community asset transfer proposals, particularly in terms of health, well-being, economic and employment opportunities that may be created in many of those communities, and the benefits that will accrue to, say, the health boards and other government agencies who are currently spending money uh, tackling issues such as obesity. Uh, and surely, if we're asking communities to be you know, responsible in drawing up business plans and looking at financial sustainability, that we should be asking the other agencies to indicate what the benefits could be accrued in terms of these asset transfers to communities from their budgets, rather than just thinking this is all a one-way street. Minister? I think that's a very fair point that Mr Wilson makes, that there are, there are benefits that will derive from this legislation and these actions that won't yet be quantifiable. Indeed, they may never be quantifiable, but um, the, the importance of the prevention agenda, I think, um, is front and centre in the minds of all ministers and the government's uh, approach. Indeed, it was uh, a key pillar of our response to the Christie Commission in terms of public service uh, reform. And if you take an area of wider 
well-being and health. Of course, part one of the bill is about national outcomes for Scotland and embedding the Scotland Performs approach in legislation that the government would have to consult upon and produce uh, uh, the outcomes and that outcome focus going forward. And it's way beyond just GDP or economic growth. It's that wider understanding of well-being. And if you relate that to projects on the ground, one of the first projects I visited, for example, was uh, Lamhill Stables. So they had great community base, great community activity. A range of organisations met there in Glasgow. Uh, they had some all allotment space, uh, some growing space, nice community garden, and there was a piece of land that they wanted to expand into, but computer says no. Council said no, if my memory serves me correctly. Now, no, uh, no reason why they couldn't expand, no understanding why. And you see how the legislation would put a process in place for them to request that transfer, the presumption would be in favour of a transfer and, and then it would be a transparent process and, crucially, with an appeals mechanism if the answer was still uh, a no and the council would have to produce solid grounds for why it was a no. Why am I raising that as an example? Because that's specifically the kind of project in an area of Glasgow that benefits from more active lifestyles and if people had access to, to that land then it would expand the options uh, uh, available to them. So it's a great example of how wider health and wellbeing, getting out with the environment, aligning with the resources that were going on in stables in the facility um, should be expanded uh, and uh, encouraged. Now, it was one of the key organisations that convinced me this was the right thing to do, and they understand how it can make a difference to their agenda and their objectives. So I think the connection is well made from government being focused on wider measurement of well-being and how the preventative approach and allowing communities to lead for themselves the kind of projects that will make a difference. You know, when I was a council leader, I um, represented Fergus Lee Park, and sometimes the best community champions for for life-changing actions. They weren't actually the social workers or the council-employed development workers as worthy as they are. It was the community champions that led the projects and delivered the projects. Let's free them up to do more of the good work that they do rather than have them mired in bureaucracy and refusals from the state. So I think that the point's very well made. Do you have further questions? Okay. Uh, Mark McDonnell, please. Th thank you, Convener. I want to touch on a, a few different areas. Um, if possible. Um, I think the Minister touched in his uh, one of his responses to Alec Rowley around the, um, the difficulties in some communities of perhaps taking advantage of this legislation. I'm thinking particularly communities of deprivation where uh, there are undoubtedly a lot of very active uh, groups and organisations, but perhaps not having some of the skills bases, for example, to draft up business plans. Now, at our evidence session in Dumfries, some of the local authorities there said they would be reluctant to um, assist groups in that process because of potential conflicts of interest. I wonder what the, the, the Minister's view would be around how we can ensure that the support is provided so that we don't have those communities with the skills base in, in place taking advantage of this legislation and other communities being left behind? Minister. I have to say, convene on all reasonableness, um, that sounds like an excuse to me. If a local authority thinks they can't support a community group in compiling a solid, robust business plan for the benefit of a community, uh, which leads to an asset transfer, I mean, conflict of interest is when you know, they'd be compromised and I see no reason why a local authority can't support local groups to to produce such a case and uh, you know local authorities and other public authorities other parts of the public sector might frustrate community groups by not providing the information that's required and that's why there'll be provision in legislation to produce the information that's required to understand what the assets are and what <coughs> buildings and what the nature uh, of the assets are um, but no I mean I'd, if we need to produce guidance to to inform local authorities of the responsibility here, then we'll do that. But um, if we were to say local authorities can't support community groups in building the business case for transfer, then who will? All external organisations that government support. So um, I think they're at more liberty than they've suggested there. Okay, thank you. Um, mo moving on to look at the, the role uh, or, or otherwise of community councils and also community planning partnerships. Um, both of these 
uh, have statutory functions, uh, statutory underpinnings. Um, there is a view of field that uh, often they're not representative um, of, of the communities that they serve. Some communities of deprivation find it difficult to be involved in community planning partnerships. And there are community councils which may cover a geographical community but nobody from that geographical community is actually represented on the community council. And I wonder if the minister has concerns that those groups which have that statutory underpinning may be uh, looked on more favourably uh, or be given more support than those groups, community organisations, which perhaps don't have that backing. Minister? It's correct to say, of course, that community councils have a statutory function, they're statutory consultees in the planning process, and a go-to organisation for most local authorities and other organisations when seeking out the opinion of local communities. But it's also fair to say, and this connects to, to Alec Rowley's point as well, around the variability of community councils. Some are very good and actually provide uh, services, run things. Others uh, might be more mid-range. Some are a talking shop and some are barely legitimate, frankly. And that's why we won't pick one group over another group as a key community anchor organisation and say that group's more important than another group because it will differ from one community to another. It might be the housing association, it might be the community council, it might be the you know, parent and toddler group. There's a range of community-led organisations carrying out a range of work. But in terms of the statutory responsibility, they have to abide by the uh, regulations as laid out. But I know we have to improve the health and vibrancy of our community councils, and that's why we continue to work with the Improvement Service and COSLA to try and support our community councils. It would be wrong to say this bill doesn't touch on community councils. It does. If you take um, a common good when considering the disposal of a change of common good assets, then that consultation should happen with community councils. So there is some reference uh, to community councils, but it continue, the performance continues to be variable across the country. It's quite telling, though, that in this year of empowerment and engagement, again, irrespective of how we all might have voted in the referendum, the fact that so many people registered to vote and then voted and are now involved in political parties. And I would like to think we can harness some of that energy into further community action and activism as well, but it may not be community councils. Um, the committee will be mindful that before the referendum, I launched a consultation in turnout and elections and look what it achieved. In the referendum, and in all seriousness, it wasn't about how easy it is to vote or where you vote and which day you vote. Is is the is the subject of an election or indeed the referendum meaningful enough to motivate people to vote? And it was. So, is the business at a community council meaningful enough for people to come to participate in it? That's the question. Uh, but I'm not proposing a whole transfer of powers from local authorities to community councils. But by unlocking the potential of communities through this legislation, a range of groups can come forward to participate in process, to initiate dialogue or consultation, to challenge the running of a service, or indeed to take over um, assets and property for the benefit of a local community. All of that will assist. But you're right, I'm not prescriptive about community councils. And there has been no action plan presented to me that proposes to radically shift the power towards community councils. I'm sorry to say that if I was to do that, then the general competence of many community councils would have to drastically improve. Mark? I appreciate that point. Um, on, on the community planning partnerships, um, the committee has received evidence from Scottish Enterprise that it does not currently set locally based targets nor share resources. Does the Minister have concerns that Scottish Enterprise may not be fulfilling its duties as a CPP partner under the terms of the Bill? Minister? It, no, I don't. And to give me further reassurance of that, I met with the Scottish Enterprise just a few weeks ago and their location directors. Uh, Scottish Government has location directors, so that's one very senior civil service official that represents the Government and supports uh, the agenda at every community plan partnership. Every um, area also has a Scottish Enterprise location director, which is also at a very senior level within Scottish Enterprise, uh, that um, enterprise agency uh, as well. They don't commit... It's true to say that the point is fair in that Scottish Enterprise doesn't commit specific budgets or targets at the most 
local level, although some community plan partnerships through their single outcome agreements do actually have targets on economic growth and, and some councils have set out how many organisations they aspire to see account managed by Scottish Enterprise. But I can absolutely guarantee the member and the committee that Scottish Enterprise is very mindful of our obligations around um, community planning and that was reinforced by my a recent visit as this legislation moves forward. And um, Lena Wilson, a Chief Executive, is very clear that they may not be bringing a budget to the table, but they should be bringing their expertise, their support, their networks, their contact to the table. And that's the kind of support that a community plan partnership would want. Of course, the legislation talks about um, what's agreed at community plan um, partnership uh, level. But what Scottish Enterprise can bring is their business expertise. And one of the key themes in community planning is economy. Of course, they are well placed to do that. And so I hope that reassures uh, the member. Uh, Scottish Enterprise functions very clear, the remit's very clear, and their growth areas are equally clear. Sometimes I find that the, one of the pressure points for local community plan partnerships or indeed councils may, for example, be town centres. A uh, very important matter in my own portfolio. Not something that Scottish Enterprise would ordinarily associate themselves with, but that's not to say they can't get business support and contacts and make the right connections to support that agenda at the most local level. So I do believe that Scottish Enterprise will be far more engaged with community plan uh, partnerships than they were before. And finally, to assist with that, the Chief Executive of Scottish Enterprise now sits on the National Community Plan Group. Okay. Mark, um, on the issue around participation requests and asset transfers, um, we heard evidence in Dumfries about local difficulties in terms of timescales for asset transfers. Um, do you see a role in the bill or in the guidance for establishing um, timescales for these processes to take place or reasonable timescales for these processes to take place because obviously for many community groups and organisations funding that they have access to is often time limited mm. um, and if a local authority uh, drags its heels uh, the funding that they have acquired can be lost. Can I, can I give you uh, some examples of that because at our evidence session in Dumfries two of the local authorities stated that they would hope to have proposals in front of elected members within six months. Dumfries and Galloway um, hope to have things done by, uh, by a term of 18 months, uh, which seems that they haven't kept to in uh, at least one case that we uh, are, are now involved in. Um, do you think, uh, as Mr Macdonald said, that there should be some uh, general rule about how long some of these processes should take? Uh, Mr Macdonald's right to identify this. There is some provision in the Bill around timescales and that may be to make further orders in relation to specific timescales. Is that correct, Jean? Yes. And the reason for that is they don't want to create a, an overly bureaucratic process that sets arbitrary deadlines, but it may be required in the planning system something I have a responsibility for. An applicant can challenge if they think the planning authority is taking too long that essentially goes for, for decision elsewhere to, to ministers through appeal. Um, so we can look more closely at the timescales issue, but I would rather that authorities act in good faith and, and uh, consider and respond timorously in any request that's made of them. I would just be slightly fearful if I set an arbitrary timescale that they then simply say no. But fortunately, because of the provisions of the bill and the presumption, then there would be a meal, uh, a, a meal, <laughs> there may be a meal after it, if a celebration, but there will be an appeals mechanism uh, which will ensure that uh, the organisation uh, will, be, will be heard. But I'm happy to give more consideration to time skills if you and your evidence think that that's necessary. It just feels ever so slightly centralising for me to set time skills rather than leave it to the local authority. But if you've got specific cases where you feel as if that process has been dragged on, well, that's unreasonable, clearly. And we'd expect local authorities and other authorities to be reasonable. I take Mr MacDonald back in. Uh, you know, from what we have heard in evidence, for some organisation, time skills are, are critical. Um, and, you know, I think that we're all very understanding that circumstances can be different in, in various places, and there may be funding issues. Big lottery has been mentioned sometimes as being something that can cause uh, a little bit of delay. Um, but, you know, I think 
we haven't seen any penalty uh, written into the legislation for any council who, who may be intransigently uh, holding something up. Uh, and I wonder if you could comment on that, because there doesn't seem to be uh, any, any stick, if you like, to, to deal with a local authority who are stalling for no apparent reason. Well, I mean, again, I'm listening very carefully to what the um, committee is saying around your example. So I have to do two things. First of all, as I've said before in your, your exploratory sessions, is ensure that we better calibrate and organise the various funding streams to support community groups rather than go through the process time and time again. So there's something in that around timing and alignment of resources to support um, worthy um, projects. In terms of the provision, um, we were looking at uh, prescribing the period in regulations made by ministers as to how long it should take for such a request to be considered. So I can be specific in that in reg regulations. I wouldn't want to do it in primary legislation, but regulations feels more proportionate and relevant. But of course, there might be a reason a community group might want to take longer. That may be funding or it may be another matter or a reason for them to do that. So we had proposed, even within that specific time frame, uh, to have uh, in a clause uh, potentially a longer period as may be agreed between the authority and the community transfer body because there may be exceptional circumstances. Um, so I'll take on board your, your evidence and uh, reflect on that in regulations. I, I think beyond the evidence, um, we'll send you um, a, a communication that we've had from, from one of the councils, which I think would be interesting for you to see. Sorry, Mark. Uh, yeah, no, Commissioner. I think the, the Minister makes a fair point, and I think I was, I was keen to ensure that we were perhaps weren't setting a, an absolute time scale, but perhaps looking at how that could be reasonably reflected. And I think the Minister said he's, he's willing to consider that uh, on time scale still, um, and looking at the common good aspect. I note in your, um, your, your correspondence to the committee, you, you discussed the benefit in requiring uh, relevant authorities to publish registers of assets, and I know that's going to apply in terms of the common good assets. One of the pieces of evidence we've taken, uh, or some of the evidence we've taken, uh, suggests that for some local authorities, uh, identification of common good asset uh, is proving to be a difficulty, uh, which I think would be a significant understatement on some of the evidence that we'd heard. So there will be some local authorities for whom this will be a, a, a much more uh, simple exercise than for others. And I wonder about the issue around timescales there as well, because from the evidence we took, it suggested that without some kind of defined timescale on this, there are local authorities who could potentially drag their heels in perpetuity in terms of putting together an asset of common good, yeah, uh, a register of common good assets. Sorry. Uh, Mr Macdonald, again, it's, uh, it's a valid criticism um, that some local authorities may take their time. However, um, current SIPFA guidelines are clear that the best professional practice is that local authorities should maintain a separate register of their common good assets, so it should not be a significant cost or bureaucracy or exercise uh, to fulfil the requirements of the bill. I fear that the understanding of some local authorities might be that they have to clarify title deeds and have them registered. That's, you know, that, that's, that's a different interpretation. I'm looking for... Um, an understanding of what are common good assets so that local communities can understand what they are uh, and then have a say over how they're uh, constructed and disposed of. Um, so essentially it's a register that I'm pursuing. Of course, you could have a whole bill dedicated to the history of uh, common goods, and I'm not proposing to go through every complication as they relate to common goods, but quite simply greater uh, participation and identification of common good assets in a register that the public can understand. Okay. okay. As to the time scale uh, issue, um, I do believe we will be producing guidance, and similar to the point you've made around time scales to consider an asset transfer request, I'll also consider if that's something we should set out in regulation. I'm very mindful that, again, the land <coughs> reform uh, group uh, considered common good matters, so that may well be something that could be considered in a future land reform bill, as well as the provisions I've outlined in this bill. Mark? Okay. Uh, I, I'm aware, Convener, I'm testing your patience on this, so this is my last question. Um, in terms of the allotment section, um, 
looking at uh, local authorities, um, do you feel that there, there should be a broader uh, approach taken in terms of the public bodies who have a duty here, um, given that there are a number of public bodies who own large areas of land and who could perhaps make a significant contribution to allotments and to the uh, food growing strategies? Minister? Yes, I think it's a very helpful suggestion. I have to place the responsibility somewhere, and as it currently rests with local authorities, it seems most appropriate. But in taking all those reasonable steps that I mentioned earlier in, that, in addressing provision, I would expect absolutely a local authority to be able to work with other public service or even private sector partners to identify those sites. Maybe it's in the interest of a private sector project, a stalled space or whatever it happens to be, to try and address uh, provision. So whilst the uh, absolute duty rests with local authorities, I would expect them to work with other public sector partners to meet that need, because it may well be police, fire, uh, health, or, or whoever, to, to meet that demand. And that would be true joint planning and resource management in the way that we would intend for community plan partnerships. Okay. Stuart McMillan, please. Uh, thank you. <coughs> I can be a, uh, good morning, Minister. Uh, Minister, just a, like a couple of quick questions on the, uh, on the allotments. Uh, Side of thing, well, section as well. Uh, last week, in evidence uh, from Ian Welsh uh, from SAGS, um, he, in written evidence that they had suggested in terms of the 250 square metres should be the, the, the defined allocation, the defined size for an allotment. And then in evidence last week, uh, he said, in a quote, uh, we want the 250 square metres there as a reference standard, not as an obligatory standard that has to be applied in all instances. Now, I was very much aware of what you said earlier on, and, and I heard what you said earlier, um, but uh, with the comments from Mr Welsh last week, um, do you not, would you suggest that that's actually it's a, a, fair, uh, a fair option that he's uh, trying to put forward in terms of an actual size for an allotment? Minister? Yes, um, I gave the reasons why we didn't want to immediately legislate for the size of an allotment because it would be inflexible, but we will produce guidance, and that guidance um, will state what we suggest a good size of allotments, and that be provided for within legislation. But I say again that um, the bill includes provision of Scottish ministers to prescribe the size of an allotment should the need arise in the future. So if the scenario that um, Anne McTaggart was talking about, the local authorities race to give folk tiny sites to meet their needs, then we have provision to legislate if that's required. Hopefully that wouldn't be required, and we would produce guidance along the lines of your question, Mr McMillan, um, but also have that flexible approach. So hopefully we meet everyone's needs in the balanced way that you suggest. Stuart? Uh, um, but uh, if, that, if that particular action... Uh, had to be taken in terms of prescribing the size uh, at some point further down the line. Uh, could that actually not be uh, be stopped uh, now in terms of actually having a defined size in the face of the bill uh, so that we could certainly save on time and save on, on uh, public resource uh, further down the line? Minister? No, because to, to then change, if we sought to change that for whatever reason, to produce a bill dedicated to the size of an allotment, I think, would incur the wrath of the population of Scotland that might wonder why we can be a bit more adept and flexible as a parliament. I say that, of course, knowing that you're sitting beside the member in charge of the High Hedges Bill. Um, I'm not saying that these are not important matters, but if we're not flexible, if we don't take account to local need and local geography, then... I think we're taking a far too centralist approach on this subject. So we provide the guidance, expect people uh, to apply. We have the provision if it's required, and we can make change through regulation, which is far swifter way to affect change if it's required than through primary legislation for the size of an allotment. It seems utterly disproportionate. So the provision's there if it's required. Um, you know, other committees might accuse me of being a a uh, centralising minister, but I'm actually trying to allow for local flexibility here, but reserving the right to prescribe the size of allotment if we're required so to do. Stuart. Okay. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, another question on uh, part three, it's on the participation requests and part five, the asset transfer requests. Uh, and uh, we've heard in evidence 
um, uh, certainly from uh, the representatives from Dundee, uh, when uh, where they suggested that actually having a named officer uh, from that local authority was actually very beneficial uh, for them and actually trying to go through uh, to do the work that they wanted to do. Uh, and uh, I'm uh, just keen to find out certainly the government's uh, opinion on this and whether the government actually supports having a named officer uh, in public bodies to actually support groups wishing to make requests under Part 3 and Part 5. Minister? It's really a matter for... for local authorities to um, consider how they um, how they conduct it. I mean, it might be helpful. It might be as a procedural function or, you know, for purposes of contact um, be more helpful. But we want to make sure that there's a shared understanding of community participation. So having clarity on who community groups go to is a good thing. But we're not passing all the responsibility for community engagement or participation within a full public authority to one named person. You might have one named person, it might be good practice for that person to be a coordinator, share information, but that's a matter for that authority. As long as there's a clear channel of who you go to and how you get information, how you initiate it all, that's fine. We won't specify that there shall be, there must be a named officer. Um, I remember in the exploratory consultation, people, some people were concerned, although it might give some clarity, but then it, it might just shift responsibility from every other officer, every other person, every other official to, to that one named person. Um, so if you take liaison of community councils, it's good that community councils have, uh, normally a council has a community council liaison officer. Um, but that person is not the only person responsible for engaging with community councils. It has to be much wider. So it's good practice, but we see no need to legislate for it because it, it diminishes responsibility into that one person, where it should be the a responsibility of the whole organisation to think about community participation. Hopefully that answers your question. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, and one final question. Yep. Yeah, just it's on the Delegated Powers uh, Memorandum um, Report. Uh, as you be aware, I sit in that committee uh, as well, uh, Minister. Uh, and it was on section. There was an issue regarding uh, section 10, uh, and uh, from that particular, uh, from, from the report. Uh, and uh, just, uh, just in terms of, just keen just to find out how the how yourself as Minister would propose to address any of the concerns raised uh, by the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, uh, that uh, that no specification has been provided about why the power in section 10 uh, has been taken, nor the circumstances in which it could be exercised. Minister? Don't uh, concern yourself with asking me unspecific questions. <laughs> um, it's my understanding uh, that ministers have agreed general power to issue guidance, uh, which doesn't have to be covered in the delegated powers memorandum. And the committee's concern was that community plan partnerships must comply with the guidance rather than have regard mm. to it. Uh, but there would be no parliamentary scrutiny of this binding requirement. So the committee's proposed the concerns would not apply if CPPs only had to have regard to the guidance and we're happy to make that change. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Minister, if, if I could move on, you, you said um, a, a minute ago in terms of na named officers, uh, you didn't think there was a, a need to legislate. Uh, one of the things which there has been some discussion about is a definition of common good. Um, and there has been debate within the committee about how you could define common good. Uh, can I ask you, Minister, why it is that the government has chosen not to include a definition of common good in the bill? Because there's really an understanding of, of what it is at the moment. If people are um, carrying out their duties uh, with the SIPFA guidance in mind, then they should all really have an, already have that understanding of what common good is. If I were, and, and there's a range of definitions and uh, legislative provision that's come up in the past because they're very historic. But if we were to create new legislation, new legislation to define it, would invariably miss a bit, and that is an unintended consequence of, of writing new legislation for something that's quite historic. So because there's an understanding of what it is at the moment, I don't feel the need to provide a new provision. I mean, some... Uh, is, is there um, a possibility 
that if there was a definition on the face of the bill that you could lead to circumstances where rather than empowering communities, you'd be disempowering them because of that definition? But essentially, yes, because they'd be lost. I mean, the people would interpret the new definition and trying to reassess what was common good. And we could lose common good assets that people have understood to be common good. So it's a legal minefield, and, and I don't think it's one that would enable and empower communities. I think it would be a feast for, for lawyers, frankly, and I don't see the, the need to do that. Um, a feast that, that said, convener, I'm well aware of the committee's concerns around previous common good battles and how some have to be progressed through the court. But as I say, that would, that would um, impede the progress of this bill if we were to have that. A feast for lawyers is, uh, I'm sure, something that we, we don't want to see. Um, does the same reasons apply for not defining alienable and non-alienable common good? And notice that I changed the, uh, the last one, because nobody can say the way it's normally defined. <laughs> uh, essentially, yes, because of how the common goods have been constructed over the years, some are you know, centuries old, some of the construct of the uh, changes to, to local authority structures. So it would be so complex uh, and bureaucratic, and I don't think it's, there's a proportionate benefit for, from doing it. That said, again, the Land Reform Review Group has covered some of these issues, so it may well be picked up in a future bill, but I don't believe it's necessary for the Community Empowerment Bill. I was very interested in your response um, earlier on round about um, the common good registers. Uh, and I think the experience of many of us round the table who have been in local government um, and what we have had in, in evidence is that there seems to be this need um, to go back sometimes uh, through centuries uh, of paperwork to ensure that something belongs to the local authority. Um, uh, and some of us could possibly argue um, that it should go on the register until, you know, maybe somebody else challenges uh, it being uh, on, on the register. Um, do you think that common sense needs to come into play in the construct of common good registers? Uh, and beyond that, do you think that Audit Scotland, who, who, who seem to, in their evidence, have a light touch on this issue, um, do you think that you know it would be helpful if, if they looked at this a little bit more than they currently are? I can be. I think that's a very helpful reflection because common sense, if applied, bear in mind that not all common good assets is actually land. Some of it might be artefacts. Um, some of it might be investments or resource, so you won't have a title for everything. Um, so the register is a collection of you know, what we believe to be common good. You know, it could be a provost chain, for example, from a former uh, borough. So wouldn't it be good practice if in that register, which we say uh, is constructed in consultation with communities and communities are involved as to how they're used or disposed of, and it doesn't do any harm if there's doubt over an asset, to put it on such a register. Because all it means is that for those items, there'll be greater community engagement and participation over the disposal of assets. So it's not as if I'm requiring all common good assets to be somehow registered with the Keeper or the Land Registry of Scotland. It's a register that people can understand in a user-friendly way, and, and that then... Um, triggers their involvement when decisions are taken about their disposal. So I think what you've suggested is common sense and should be applied. There has been suggestion um, from uh, some witnesses that there should be a national register. Um, do you think that that in itself may cause difficulty if that were to come into play uh, because it may give uh, opportunity for the, some of these folks who in the past uh, have tried to, who have tried to gain title uh, to land uh, and make their job easier. Do you think a national common good register would be workable? Not particularly. I suppose you could produce a live update of the uh, 32 councils uh, registers, but I don't see what purpose it would serve when this is about local empowerment and participation, so I don't see how it helps us with the national picture. What we know is the value of the... Uh, 
assets and investments as reported by local authorities. But I don't think that a national register would help. As I say, when you understand that some of these common good assets, as important as they are to local communities, might be paintings or artefacts or provost chains, some of its investments, which will change daily the value of those investments, and some of it, of course, is land. They're all, they're all different to each local community. Some within local authorities, particularly, I suppose, particularly the accountancy and legal world, would have us wind up common good funds and just put them into mainstream budgets for local authorities to distribute as they see fit. Well, it's been this government's position to um, protect uh, the common good portfolio in that they reflect you know, the inheritance, essentially, of a local community. So we propose not to wind them up and put them in with general funding. Uh, finally, on, on this uh, particular subject, uh, Minister, um, in terms of the asset transfer provisions in Part 5 of the Bill, how do you see them operating uh, if the land uh, is, is deemed to be common good, or building for that matter, is deemed to be common good? I think there are specific um, provisions, and you know this is where your... Um, Inalienable, ina <laughs> non alienable, uh, non -alienable yeah. <laughs> provision uh, comes into play. Um, so if it is inalienable, let's go for that. That would be a restriction uh, on the. It would be an a restriction on the local authority's ability to transfer the asset in the same way as any other condition or burden in the title deeds. The local authority could seek court approval for disposal in the usual way. However, that's because it's a common good. Uh, land asset. I don't think, um, depending on the use of some common good land, there is actually a problem with how they can be used, which I was just coming to. There would be no restriction on a community body using, managing or leasing the asset. It's transfer, ownership, disposal uh, that's the issue there. As long as it fits uh, with the use for which the property was uh, acquired. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. Good morning once again. And I should, make, should have made a declaration earlier, uh, Convener, that I'm the chair of a community organisation currently going through uh, negotiations with a local authority regarding community asset transfer. And it is the, the issues around that that I want to bring. Stuart McMillan raised the question about the named person. Uh, the Minister will be aware that in some of the evidence this committee has heard uh, from community organisations, they have claimed to have been sent round the departments, council departments, trying to pin down the responsible council officers that can actually deal with and give a, an answer to uh, questions they may have regarding community asset transfer. And while, uh, Minister, you stated earlier you weren't in favour of having a named person. Would the Minister be mindful to review the position if we found that many community organisations were being, what they would effectively say, being blocked from making a community asset transfer application because they could not identify, or the Council were not prepared to identify, the relevant officers to deal with those community asset transfer requests? Minister? I would think if there's legal provision and a presumption in favour um, of both a participation request or an asset transfer, that procedures should be in place that, that take account of that legal provision. In the same way, as was mentioned earlier, on freedom of information, you know, there is responsibility there for it to be processed. So I think the legal parameters, the legal requirements should uh, encourage authorities to have good process in place because if they don't then I suspect that the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman would have something to say about it if a request wasn't handled competently and effectively uh, and that takes us back to the timing question that if an authority messed around with a bid or a request um, then the clock is ticking for them, and I think they would be at greater risk of not being seen to be handling a request competently if they didn't even get the right person involved. So I don't want to be too specific to answer Mr Wilson's uh, question about how 
uh, local authorities should conduct themselves. And again, I say local authorities, but it will be all parts of the public sector, how they should conduct themselves specifically, but they will have to evidence how they've seriously considered any bid, and in doing so should do it timorously and effectively. And um, you know, there'll be a burden upon them to show if they're refusing, on what grounds they're refusing, and you know, leaving that to the last minute would seem careless on their part. So I think it would risk challenge if they didn't carry out the process properly. John? Minister, thank you for that response, and I'm glad you've put on the record the legal requirement of local authorities to engage actively with communities regarding this issue. The other question is, it goes back to something similar to the convener's question about the asset transfer, the value of either the land or the property that is being transferred. Now, at the present moment, I know from discussions with other community organisations that some local authorities are putting a market value on the land or the property that is to be transferred, which is a, it can be a disincentive for some community organisations, particularly when they are looking at the issue of drawing down funding from other organisations, such as the big lottery, to carry out major improvement works or to carry out building works on the land being transferred. What advice would the Minister care to give local authorities where requests are made by community organisations to look at asset transfer at either zero value or low cost value in relation to taking on those assets? Minister. Um, just to make a point on the previous question about the um, named officer, just this important point of emphasis, before the Ombudsman or indeed the courts wouldn't have had any legislation um, really to point to, other than good or bad practice, to say you didn't handle that bid for an asset transfer competently. Whereas with the presumption and all the legislation in here, the courts and the Ombudsman will be able to point to what council should have done. So I think that's a game changer in terms of where community rights are in this. In terms of the value of asset transfer requests, um, local authorities can already transfer assets without realising the full commercial value, and they've been able to do that for some time. That's already been within their provisions, as long as they do it, of course, in a transparent way. But I reflected that Scottish Government couldn't do that because the, the Scottish Public Finance Manual had no mention. In fact, I think it expected market value to be realised. And in advance of this legislation, I've already changed that so that right now it's a consideration that if there's an asset transfer to a local community, that the wider social benefit can be considered, not just realising commercial value. So that's a change that's already happened. It didn't require the law. It required a change to our uh, accountancy practice, which we've done. So that now extends to, to government. So I think this bill will raise expectations and deliver the kind of culture change that's required. It will be for each you know, legit, legitimate local body to determine what level of uh, transfer or contributions uh, proportionate and relevant, but it could be zero. You know, if the, if the public benefit is such that justifies that the local authority might not want any transfer, any cash value for transferring the property. Now, some groups may choose uh, leasing or use of rental rather than ownership, but we're not specific that um, it should be a zero-sum game, but we keep that flexibility locally. Um, but I think the council would have to show a reasonableness around that. And if the answer is no or a refusal or it's challenged, then um, that can go to appeal at the local level. So to be clear, local authorities right now do not have to realise the commercial value valuation of a property and that will be made very clear in the guidance that comes from this bill but that is already the case and they should know that okay, thank you minister alec Rowley, please thanks could, could i maybe focus a bit on outcomes 
and a couple of questions on outcomes. But firstly, the the duty of Scottish ministers to develop, consult on and publish a set of national outcomes for Scotland. One of my questions would be, I suppose, what currency, what, what value do these outcomes have and where do they sit alongside national organisations sitting working to a set of national targets? For often, and for example, it's often said within community planning partnerships that the NHS are working to certain targets and some of those targets can actually conflict with the outcomes trying to be achieved through the community planning partnership. So is there going to be a, a joining up there and is, is the national outcomes going to supersede targets or, or do organisations still have that conflicting um, competing interest? Minister? Well, we should all be operating as Team Scotland at a national level, and the national outcomes, the 16 of them, um, do feed into the, the local outcomes through the uh, single outcome agreement. So there should already be an alignment. What this will do is put it on a statutory footing. It's recognised internationally as good practice and how the government conducts its business um, in aligning the government's agencies and departments towards these national outcomes, towards our purpose, and that does work all the way through in partnership to community plan um, partnerships. And uh, There's indicators beneath each of the national outcomes, but the national outcomes are they're difficult to, to argue with, but they give you some clarity as to what you're uh, trying to achieve um, as a government. But I would expect even closer alignment because it's on a statutory footing and agencies that are aware of it at the moment will be even more aware of it as it's placed uh, in legislation uh, in terms of the duty on ministers. Alec? I think, I mean, I think heat targets is the one that's commonly referred to by, by people in NHS, um, where, where they have said, indeed, I've attended meetings with yourself and the finance secretary have been present and NHS chairs have raised the fact that there is sometimes a conflict between mm. the different targets that they are trying to meet um, and, and the set of outcomes that are agreed by, by NHS. But perhaps, perhaps the Minister can, can therefore explain his thinking a bit more in terms of those national outcomes coming into the community planning partnership outcomes and how that then relates if communities have to have a more proactive role and, and, and how services are planned and delivered. I think the, the convener has given an example where we've been taking evidence uh, from his own constituency where, where a, a, a local um, community were arguing that, that one of the key priorities for them was mental health. And they were being told that one of the key priorities of the partnership, because it was within their health and, and, and wellbeing outcomes, was, was, was uh, smoking cessation. And, and, and they seem to conflict a bit. So how do these things, how do these things actually yeah. operate in a joined up way so that we have joined up government and joined up services and, and that then filters through into community planning and somehow filters up for the, the, the communities and the views and communities of what their priorities are? I, sh I should clarify, it wasn't in my constituency, it was in my previous council ward and it was before the days of of uh, the integrations that uh, we're now going through. Uh, sorry, I, <coughs> I had to clarify that, Minister. On you Fine. go. Yeah. Well, certainly most of the Community Empowerment Bill is about people, uh, empowerment, uh, and that preventative uh, approach. But another pillar of public service reform is integration, of course. And at the level, the national level, uh, the, the outcomes are think straightforward things that we can all agree on. They're not in conflict at all with the um, accountability of um, local community plan partnerships or departments and agencies uh, with, within. You know, for example, national outcome, our children have the best start in life and are ready to succeed. If we take health, as Alec Rowley's done, we live longer, healthier lives. Well, the next one we've tackled is significant inequalities in Scottish society. So I could go on, but they're all, I think, quite clear national outcomes and public bodies should align themselves to support those national outcomes. Certainly Cabinet does, Ministers do, Departments do, and local community plan partnerships have the range of indicators and 
the menu of options, what's most appropriate at the local level. <coughs> now, to touch on the critical issue that you have done, uh, the health service, yes, are very driven with heat targets, very specific health targets, of course. Um, local authorities are driven sometimes by other targets, statutory targets and uh, increasingly their own um, benchmarking. But they'll have that sense of responsibility to their own organisations, but community plan partnership level, they should be sharing the responsibility and accountability for each other's actions at meeting the plan for place in a single outcome agreement. Because you can't resolve most of these outcomes nationally or locally in isolation. Children won't have healthier lives if public bodies aren't working together. So the targets all matter because we're accountable as the government, as MSPs, for meeting those targets in a way that councils are accountable for meeting their uh, local obligations as well. But the bill and the legislation and its nature expects public sector partners to work together to focus on outcomes as uh, delivered uh, by this uh, process. But there will still be the room for that localism. But it's about sharing the goals uh, and the targets, having a greater sense of shared responsibility, because that's what the Accounts Commission has identified. They don't be too departmentalised, but think more as a partnership in how you provide local services. Sometimes far too often... And you gave some examples. Great partnership projects have happened in spite of community plan partnership boards rather than because of them. So they've got to create the right culture of partnership, mindful of their own targets, because I'm sure if we abandoned heat targets, there are indeed input measures the Labour Party would be first to criticise us for doing so. Uh, so we have to keep targets uh, in place but they're not in conflict with each other because working in partnership to focus on the outcomes. And increasingly, as a parliament, we have to move away from outputs to focus on outcomes. And this process is recognised as, as world-leading practice in that respect. I suppose, Minister, it's trying to, and I'm, I'm not saying there's easy answers to this, it's trying to get to a point where there's a tangible outcome that you can measure and say, yeah, that made a difference as a result of mm. these organisations coming together and planning. You referred earlier to the Christie Commission, but the Christie Commission was very clear. We couldn't go the way we were going. We needed to see much more preventative work actually happening. And if you take something like children that you mentioned earlier, the number of children that are being taken into care or the care of local authorities across Scotland is continuing to rise. Um, despite possibly community planning partnerships having, having had that outcome and it being a strategic outcome, at what point does this actually become real for people, real for communities and measurable so that you're actually saying that's what that means, that's what community planning partners are signing up for, that's the role of the third sector, it's the role of it's where our funding's been driven. At what point is that happening or, or are we just simply talking at high level and the reality on the ground and the two never meet? Minister? I, I think it's something that's very difficult, and I, I think you helpfully identify this. It's very difficult to legislate for. You know, Thou shall work in partnership to focus on outcomes, I think, is already there, and it certainly be strengthened on this because uh, local community plan partnerships uh, have to be consistent with the national outcomes, but there's, there's flexibility as to how it's done locally. So I think the analysis is right that we need to do, take more of that preventative approach but it can't be done, I don't think, through legislation unless we're you know, amending structures, for example, health and, and social care. But the best interventions are coming from projects and partnerships and joint working. Um, if you take something like um, the Positive Parenting Programme or, or, or Partnership Nurseries, they're largely delivered in partnership between health and local authorities, not one part of the public sector but a partnership, aligning resources, sharing good practice, co-locating. And that's something that we shouldn't have to legislate for. That should be happening through the statement of ambition, through the preventative approach, through the general approach to, to public service uh, reform. Now, the change funds, over half a billion pounds, were intended to achieve so, some of that transformational change. Health and social care integration should achieve more of that. So that's about doing what we can within our existing resources. I don't think we need a, legis a further legislative basis um, to uh, achieve that. It is about leadership and practice 
uh, on the ground. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with you about the legislation. That's why I think we've got to be careful about claims of what this bill can actually achieve. And, and, and there's, something, there's something more fundamental if we're going to tackle some of these national outcomes mm. that are out there. But going to let me focus on another example then in terms of the role of Scottish Enterprise, because Scottish Enterprise did come and give evidence to the committee and they, they did talk about their role as a community planning partner. But they will, they will have um, national outcomes, I assume, in terms of they're very focused on inward investment, they're very focused on large companies and, and jobs that come from there. But actually, at a local community planning level, there are two key issues. There is the issue of targeting and supporting the growth of SMEs, because that's where the, the real job creation at the local level will actually come from. And secondly, it's about people being able to have the skills at the local level. It's about holding to account the education authority, the colleges, um, and working together. And therefore, at that local level, I would argue that, that Scottish Enterprises' input into a local community planning partnership is fairly limited. And actually, what we need is local employers engaged and actually playing a more leading role. At one of the sessions that you attended with COSLA, one of the criticisms for the third sector was that, that they felt that the community planning partnerships were dominated by the local authorities and the health authorities. What was their role? But I would argue, what was the role for business and industry at a mm. local level as well? And should we look again at that and look at what kind of measurable outcomes are put in place and who's in charge of actually driving that agenda? Um, Mr Rowley will be aware that if you take local economic development, that is the responsibility of, of local councils. That function was transferred post-2007, post-Concordat, uh, and, and from that business gateway provides some of that interface and the, the smaller and the, the, the new business startups and so on. But that said, as I mentioned earlier, Scottish Enterprise would still have a role to play in bringing their expertise to the table. Uh, they've got a very clear remit and they're actually very good at the remit and I would argue being able to bring in hundreds of jobs to a specific site or sustaining jobs or expanding jobs is equal uh, on scale is equally important to a local community than uh, the small and uh, the medium sized uh, enterprises so it's all about balance I think there is something about greater engagement of uh, the private sector be it chambers of commerce or key local employers in understanding what a community plan partnership is doing because it will then connect to um, uh, the employment agenda, preparing young folk for vocational opportunities and understanding the nature of a local population as well. So there's some benefit of that. We don't create a new bureaucracy, but there is a greater role for the private sector to be party to community plan partnerships. But their first engagement has to be with the community to establish um, what they want. So I don't disagree that we have to make the right connections with the business and industrial world to make sure that our young people have got skills and opportunities for the future. I mean, equally, you know, someone from Scottish Enterprise might sit at a board meeting on a community plan partnership and listen for hours about inequality and health inequality and deprivation and housing. They might think, why does that matter? to me, or to Scottish Enterprise, well, they'll understand the local workforce and some of the challenges that it's faced and some of the difficulties through geographic inequality and deprivation as well. And then in partnership, they can work out how they support that and produce strategies going uh, forward. So I don't object to greater private sector exposure to community planning because it's not just a seat at the table. It has to go much wider and deeper than that. Thank you. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much, convener. Could I go back to this um, uh, common good land and the minefield that it is that we've got in it here, and alienable and inalienable uh, common good? Is it not, as it's such a minefield, would you not consider leaving it out of the bill, since we haven't got any definition? Minister. Uh, I could do for an easy life, Mr Buchanan, but <laughs> I'm proposing um, uh, to have it in because um, in all of our work and in the exploratory work, people wanted a greater say over how resources, their taxes and their resources are spent and used in their local area. And even more so with common goods because much of the population at a local level understands there's a common good in existence and that's for the benefits of the, the benefit of the inhabitants of that area. And there was criticism 
There's not enough engagement, not enough understanding, not enough transparency, and not enough community involvement in all of that. And I think this bill will redress that with participation and transparency, the register and involvement. So I'm not trying to undo hundreds of years' worth of legislation and accumulation of common good disputes. But as a principle, we want greater involvement with local communities as to how their common good is used or indeed um, uh, recorded. And, I, and, I, and that's been welcomed. Cameron? But it can't be defined. That's the problem, surely. Isn't that the problem? Is it cannot be defined, therefore it's going to be very loose. Are we not just going to get hung up on this bit of common good land and, as, you know, rather than the rest of the bill? That's what I'm concerned about. No, because my time's only been consumed in terms of common good with one, one act through Parliament, and that was Portobello <coughs> High School, and it yeah. was a very specific request from the Council through a private bill um, to be able to use that land for a different function. Other than that, I have to say it doesn't dominate my mailbag or inbox as it is in modern times, of course. Um, so it's not absorbing my time. But if we try to define it, my fear is we'll leave something out and that will disempower the community rather than uh, empower them uh, by an omission. So I don't see the urgent need uh, to define it, but I do see a need to, to give communities greater involvement with what our understanding it is right now. And you say because SIPFA, you know, the, the accountants within local authorities already know largely what common good assets there are, all we're asking is that it's put on a register so that the public can understand what it is and they then have involvement as to how it's used. That is not a huge new burden. And that, sorry, and that includes movable assets as well, like pictures and stuff, things like that, as you said. Yes, I mean, I don't think yeah. you can exclude you know, uh, elements. So okay. there, shouldn't be too bureauc you. there should be an inventory of these things. There should be an inventory. Well, there probably is in most cases, but in some cases it won't necessarily be. I was just trying to yeah. clarify that. Thank you. Thank you. And McTaggart, please. Thanks, convener. Um, and just to share with the Minister, um, one, uh, on one of our fact-finding visits... I had met up with a plot holder who is a single parent and told us, my allotment is my garden, my kitchen, my dining room, my gym and my social worker. Can the minister, um, which was all very good and, and rich and, and it just shows what the allotment um, community, how it supports itself and, and the impact that it has on the lives of people involved in it, but can the Minister answer um, how the provisions of the Bill will further highlight the help with those with mental and physical disabilities? What help they will receive um, to run an allotment plot? Minister? I don't think the Bill would say anything specific about that. Anne McTaggart's identified some of the benefits of, of having an allotment and participating in that healthy lifestyle, I, I think many of us uh, could uh, enjoy that. But the bill I'm proposing to, to insert an amendment that talks a bit more about inequalities, because I think that's necessary, uh, so that when people are weighing up decisions around asset transfers and so on, that they think about inequalities. Now, that may well be something in terms of allotments, um, that, that, that local authorities want to, to consider more fully. So the benefits are well understood, and those who could benefit most, you know, um, may may pursue allotments. But I won't put anything specific within the bill about who benefits. I'm being corrected. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if Doctor thought, yeah, Mister, yeah, then that's you? fine. Okay. Yeah. Because the other two are silent. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, I think we, you might pay know, for that, Minister, at a later date. <laughs> Do Dr Fox. Currently, the provisions in the bill as drafted mm. only apply to physical disability. Mm -hmm. We've had ongoing discussions, obviously, with stakeholders since the bill's been drafted, and we recognise that that needs to be extended. So we're suggesting that at stage two, an, amend an amendment be included to broaden the definition in relation to disability. 
Thank you. We heard it here first. <laughs> and you want to come back in? No, no, that's fine. Thank you. Thank you very Go much. for something else whilst you're <laughs> on a roll. <laughs> Minister, um, within uh, the bill itself, uh, there's uh, talk of annual reports on local outcome improvement plans. Um, can you give us an idea of how important you think that these annual reports uh, will be um, and how will they encapsulate within them the involvement that there has been with communities and the C C CPP? Well, well, clearly the improvement plans will uh, identify what needs to be done and, and how it will be done, and particularly uh, in partnership. And with the extended, uh, expanded duties to consult with people, then um, you would expect local communities to be involved. And again, the plan for place it is really important. And, and I said I want to strengthen uh, accountability and community plan partnerships. Uh, and so I think that that will need to make reference to the uh, national standards on engagement, which are already in place. Not everyone keeps to them. So I think that that legislative provision that I should be able to bring forward at stage two uh, will sharpen that and refine that. But of course, we'd expect uh, people to take the local improvement plans seriously. And then there's the proportionate um, inspection and auditing of community plan partnerships and local authorities as well through the quality assurance programme that we've undertaken in partnership. Uh, thank you. Uh, in terms of, of auditing, and we've heard from the uh, Accounts Commission and the Auditor General on, on various points, how can the government and parliament hold CPPs to account uh, for the delivery of their local outcomes? Well, I think we look at the national picture, and clearly you'll see reports, uh, as I will, uh, government's role, um, we'll have a location director in every community plan partnership. We'll see the indicators. Um, I'm not sure that the committee and the parliament should have a specific role in probing individual community plan partnerships because it does feel, that feels slightly centralist, um, unpicking or picking on a community plan partnership. So we should understand the national strategy, the national themes, the legislative framework, and of course, you absolutely hold the government to account on our performance um, as well, and ministers and uh, collectively local authorities. I think what more energy has to be spent on is how local communities hold their community plan partnerships to account. And I think that's a fair criticism as to how we do that, because you can't just wait for the, the rolling nature of, of the audit agencies to reach a community plan partnership. I think there has to be something uh, more specific to local communities holding them to account rather than us in Edinburgh holding each 32 community plan partnerships to account. It doesn't feel proportionate. And how will we know better what's right for a local community than that local community? That's who needs empowered, not necessarily Parliament, although I'm sure we'll execute our national uh, duties uh, adequately. I look forward to your recommendations if you think there's a further process that should be considered. Indeed. Um, uh, in terms of all of this together, uh, consultation with communities being um, the key. They're involved uh, at various levels in their own communities. They will be involved in terms of uh, the local uh, outcome improvement plans. Um, how do communities uh, deal with the national outcomes, uh, will communities be consulted uh, with on the formulation of national outcomes? Yes, it would be our expectation to consult widely, to publish and review those set of outcomes. And you know, if it's about the people of Scotland, then of course we should engage with the people of Scotland. But I wouldn't want to specify how that should be done in primary legislation, but it absolutely uh, should be done. Uh, finally, um, as we've been out and about, often we hear uh, a lot of the negative stories, the things that aren't working out there, but there are also a huge amount of positives. And I know it's very difficult to uh, legislate to ensure that uh, common sense uh, goes across the board, but how do we ensure um, that best practice um, is exported throughout the country? 
Well, I'm loath to say a website convener because we tried that and it didn't particularly work. Um, but new social media is showcasing great community projects and great third sector projects. And we'll work closely uh, with What Works Scotland, which is a particular piece of research and an exercise into what's working well in community plan partnerships. And uh, that's, that's quite a specific uh, piece of work. And we'll work closely with um, the National Community Plan Group and third sector organisations nationally and locally to showcase uh, what can work. But the best projects speak for themselves, whether transfer or transformative or life changing. And then we can uh, replicate much of these kind of projects around the country. And I think it will be worth looking at those projects that have received funding. As I've mentioned the funds that we're expanding, and hopefully that will have a domino effect on, on others, whether it's uh, land acquisition or transfer of assets as to how it can make a difference to local communities and be very um, empowering. But I think we do have to... Uh, notwithstanding some criticism, raise expectations of the bill so that people take advantage of it when it's uh, commenced. Thank you very much for your evidence this morning, Minister. I suspend and we move into private session. Thank you.